Hey everybody, Mackenzie here with Adventures with White Oak Legends and I wanted to let you guys know that um, we've been a little slow on media content lately. We're just waiting for the weather to break. Um, it's been brutal here in southern Illinois. High winds for fishing videos and stuff. It's very difficult and then also um, just the temperature. It's just not been great to get out. Um, the boat project's coming along. I do have videos and stuff of content together that I'm going to splice together, but on this episode that we want to share with you is the testimony of the apparel company that we chose to do our White Oak Legends t-shirts. Um, so far, Train has been phenomenal to work with, and the owner actually shared um, this testimony that I'm going to attach here, kind of like a podcast form. Um, she shared this with me when she dropped off our order of t-shirts, and it inspired me, and I hope it inspires you. Um, stay tuned for more content, and as soon as we get any, I'll be posting it. See you guys. Page 14 of The Unfolding is the story of Jason and Sally Hansen. So when I realized how wicked a person I was, I mean, that's, that's when my heart broke. And that's truly when God showed up and, and he changed my heart. And that's the moment that the color came back in the room. I mean, it was literally like a light switch went on. God's story has been unfolding. Since the beginning of time. He invites you to be a part of it. Another page in the unfolding. God is all about transforming lives. For Jason Hansen, the arc of transformation runs from a church pew through atheism all the way to walking away from a lucrative career to serve God and love others. Doubts, pain, the suffering we experience in life, they had all led Jason to question his faith. And when the doubts finally tipped the scale, he told his wife, Sally, he'd become an atheist. And that set him on a journey to find out truth. Here's Jason and Sally. I was eight years old when my mom passed away and I have two brothers and a sister. And my dad had had a really rough childhood and then obviously a, a, a tough life as a young adult with losing his wife and having four young children. And so he didn't handle it very well and became an alcoholic and struggled in a lot of ways. Um, eventually he kind of left the family and we were left to be adopted or um, go to foster care. And fortunately I was taken in by my aunt and uncle. And that's when I first started going to church. You know, I'd, I'd been to church, you know, uh, for Easter or Christmas or something but had never really went to church and didn't know about Jesus and, you know, um, read the Bible or anything. And, you know, that was like the opportunity where I thought, oh, well, maybe my mom's in heaven. So, you know, I want to be a Christian so I can see my mom again. Hmm. Um, but that's as far as, as far as it went. And uh, I really looked down on my dad and others that, um, you know, struggled with things. You know, I, I thought I was better than them. And and so it wasn't about, you know, being a Christian wasn't about me being transformed. It was about me just being a better person because I was going to make different decisions than other people. Hmm. And so I, you know, lived that way for a long time. You know, it was, uh, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, Sally and I got married, started a family, and... That's a hard way to live when you think that you're better than others. And I realized that, you know, three, three years ago, whenever I started to really think about my life and, you know, what was important and God, I realized I wasn't even sure if God existed, you know, hmm. because we're, we're told that everything can be explained by science, you know, that there's no need for God. And that's what I was taught in high school. And that's what I was taught in college. And so between me just wanting to be a better person and making different decisions and looking down on others and hearing that, you know, in the educational system, you know, as I was growing up and in college, that led me to, to decide God didn't exist and uh, became an atheist after being a, a, a supposed Christian for 20 plus years uh, and being a lukewarm churchgoer, you know. Um, so I became an atheist and, you know, didn't, didn't believe God existed and so that was a really, a, really a trying period. Sally, let me just ask you. So when you when you met Jason mm -hmm. and dated, were you a believer? I was. I was a late believer. I 
didn't become a Christian until I was 21. Uh, I didn't go to church either as a young adult or a child. I always had people in my life that would drag me to church with them. Their parents made them go, so they made me go. And that's what happened. I was dating someone whose parents, every time the door was open, we went to church and I was saved huh. at, that, at that late age. Uh, then I, but I had no one else in my life that went to church, uh, went to college. And my roommate, just by chance, um, was a believer, was a Christian. She bought me my first Bible. And not soon after that, that's when I met Jason. And when you met Jason, mm-hmm. he was a Christian also? Yeah. He, he actually, I remember one of our first conversations is, uh, I have to know if you're a Christian because I don't, I'm not going to date you because I won't marry you. That was one of our like first conversations. And I'm like, you can okay. check it off. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> and was that for you, Jason? Was that a way of hedging against, I don't want to experience like what my dad went through, so I want to make sure you're a good person too? It wasn't a conscious thought, but looking back now, I absolutely, I think that was part of that because, you know, the the people in my life at that point that were Christians and went to church, you know, not that their lives were perfect or they didn't have problems, but, you know, just looking at from where I came from, that nobody went to church and struggled with drugs or alcohol or, or things like that. I was like, I, I want to have a better life than that. And I want to have a better family you know, situation for, you know, any children we might have. So absolutely, I think that's the case. Hmm. So you dated, you got married, Mm -hmm. and in the early part of your marriage, what was your, what was faith like for you? We went to church on Sundays, went to Sunday school, uh, married couple Sunday school, it was a little small Baptist church, had our first child after five years, and, and, you know, we, we loved our church. It was a great church in uh, Titusville, Florida, and... You know, our in my head, I felt like our faith was growing, and we had a a good relationship at that point. Yeah. So, when did you start to notice a change in your husband and his faith? Do you remember what began to tip you off that something was going on? Um, one of his coworkers got diagnosed with cancer, and I think that made him reevaluate why, why all the suffering, why all the pain. There wasn't a significant like thing leading up, it was pretty much a snap of your fingers and it was a change. It, it kind of a woke up that way, I guess. Wow. Um, and he didn't share anything with me for a while um, about what he was going through. He shared it with friends, um, but with me, he, he didn't. And I remember just crying and praying on our bedroom floor because I didn't know what was going on. What was going on, Jason? Uh, well, I mean, a friend got diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was also at the same time, uh, if you remember about the 21 Christians, I believe, in Egypt that were beheaded on the beach. And they were given the option, if I remember correctly, to denounce Christianity or Jesus, and they didn't. And I And they were beheaded for it. And so to me, I was like, I can't do that. I mean, I wasn't going to do it. And so between that and then the problem of evil and suffering and a, and a few other things, and, and honestly, me being a lukewarm church churchgoer, I mean, I, I sat in church thinking about, you know, everything but God and everything but how to be a better person and to love others. And, um, you know, that what really wasn't important. Uh, it was more about, you know, a, appearances maybe being better than other people and, and people I'm sure assumed that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a good person, but on the inside, I wasn't. I mean, you know, sitting in church thinking about money or, you know, lust or greed or jealousy, envy. It, I mean, you name it, uh, any sin. I mean, I, I, it was all in me. And, you know, I thought as long as I don't behave that way on the outside, if I, as long as I don't make those decisions, then I'm okay. But I know now Jesus said, you know, if you think that way, then it's a sin. And, you know, I guess I just always glossed over that um, and tried to, you know, reconcile that in some way. And, and obviously it can't be done because, you know, if you're thinking that way on the inside, you know, it's wrong and, and you know, you're sinful. But even during that time, I remember thinking about others who, who weren't Christians but would, you know, denounce God or do things that, you know, I thought was wrong and uh, I'd be thinking, well, why doesn't God just come down and, 
and smite these people right now. <laughs> you know, if he exists, why didn't he just do that? And what I didn't realize is that how wicked a person I was, and that if he was going to come down and get rid of sinners, well, that's going to include me too. I mean, he he's going to have to, you know, to to get rid of me. And I had no idea that that was the case hmm. at that point in time. So she talked about how it was like a snap, and she there was this change. Do you remember that? And yeah, it was uh, December of 2015. You know, after after my mom passed away, we grew up extremely poor at times to the point to where we didn't have electricity, um, didn't have much food in the house. Um, so I, you know, went through some some rough times uh, growing up as a child. And so fast forward to 2015, you know, I, I'm getting to coach one of the best basketball teams in the state of Illinois. I am working a, a sales job, making more money than I ever could have dreamed about making. Uh, everything was going great. You know, I mean, Sally and I had a happy marriage. We were fine. Three, three boys that were growing and, and healthy. And, and so everything seemed to be perfect, you know, and then that's kind of when, uh, in December of 2015, when, when a friend got sick with cancer, saw the Christians beheaded and it literally was a Monday night. It was just like a, a conscious, uh, decision God doesn't exist, so why am I going through the motions? Why am I, why am I faking this? And so, yeah, I mean, it was just a, it was almost like a snap of the fingers. And so, but at the same time, I realized that if God doesn't exist, then nothing really matters. There's no right and wrong. I'm going to be dead in 30 years, and nobody's going to care. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm a good husband, a good father, a good neighbor. Hmm. It doesn't matter. So did you share that with Sally? How did you find out about that, Sally? I don't know if I actually gave him an ultimatum. Like, you have to tell me what's going on. I just remember crying a lot <laughs> and not knowing. Um, did he seem to you like he was depressed or he was just different? I don't know if I would use the word depressed necessarily, but at the same time, I'll say there were two days that stand out in my head that I honestly didn't know if he would be home when I got back. So it was a tough time. Because you thought he would leave or because you thought he might take his life? I didn't know. You didn't know. Yeah. yeah. He was that different of a person. He had no hope. There is no hope without God in Jesus. There just isn't. And for me, it was such a struggle because I was a new Christian basically when we met. And he has been the leader in our family. The God, in my head, the godly leader in our family. We have three boys. And so that change in him was so drastic. It was devastating to me, but I, I had to still be mom right, and a good wife. So did you have a conversation? Were you acknowledged? We did eventually, but I, I guess I struggled with how to start that conversation or what to even say. Um, it was a good two weeks, I think. Yeah. And eventually, you know, we, we did talk and I, I explained everything. And, you know, of course she was like, what are you talking about? But I was honest and, and told her exactly what I thought. And so I decided I was going to at least search for truth. You know, so if God doesn't exist and, you know, there is no hope uh, there, then at least what is true. And so I began doing a lot of research and studying science, history, archaeology, you know, a lot of different things you know, areas of study to figure out, okay, well, what, what is true? And so that led me to, you know, or led me on a journey to find out a lot of uh, information and knowledge that I hadn't been exposed to before. So you got on the internet and started searching other religions? Well, I, fortunately, my sales job, I had to get a certain amount of work done and then I could, you know, do whatever else I needed to do outside of that. So, um, I would get the work done that I needed to and make sure it, my job was good. But then after that, I would spend time reading uh, online or books and then also listening to podcasts of, of different you know, philosophers, scientists, and doing a lot of research and really you know, not necessarily believing in the God of the Bible. But what I learned was we can't be here without something behind all this. You know, when atheist scientists are using words like impossible, uh, miracle, can't explain how or why. That's not what I was taught in high school and college. I was taught that 
they had all the answers, that they could explain it very easily. And I learned that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So that kind of opened my mind up, okay, well, if that's correct, then maybe God does exist. You know, maybe there is a God there. That doesn't necessarily mean the God of the Bible, but, but something behind why we're here, how we got here. So how long did that season of searching go on? I don't have an exact time, but it was a, probably a good three to four months of really doing a lot of research to where I was studying anywhere from 10 to 14 to 16 hours a day. You were on an intense search. Mm -hmm. You were going to find an answer. Yes. What did you do in that three to four months? After he disclosed everything and what was going on, I had I had a... I don't want to say a plan to prayer, but I, I knew what I would to pray for for God mm -hmm. instead of just crying help. I knew now that I was going to pray for his salvation, for his relationship, to him f to find the answers. He had to find them himself. He had he had to take that journey. Uh, I didn't know what would lead you know at the end of the journey what that was going to look like, but during that time, it 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 still was it was extremely stressful because literally he got home from work and listened to a podcast. He was very disconnected from all of us. And we kind of had to give him that space mm -hmm. to, allow, to allow him to do that. Could you ever have imagined that you would be praying for your husband's salvation? No. Yeah. No, not at all. Because like I said, he, he was our spiritual leader in our mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. I looked to him for, he was kind of my meter of, okay, is this right or is this wrong? And that's, that was my, my line. I knew to go to him and ask. But you were learning how to go to God now yeah. in a whole different way. In a whole different way. What was that like for you? It was scary at first because I, you know, I had a partner for 20 years that um, was always there for me for everything. I mean, basically for all my needs um, on earth, but then he was kind of gone from that. So I think I, I, he and I don't have a ton of conversations about that time anymore, but I think I had to grow probably more than him at that point because I lost everything in my head. I, you know, that's how I felt. So all I did have was God and these three little boys looking at me. And did you find God show up for you? Absolutely, daily. I wouldn't have made I I wouldn't have made it and still loved him if I didn't have God. Mm -hmm. To be honest, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I will I will say one thing. You know, she had mentioned that I was, she thought I might be depressed. And I had several good friends I mean, and people that I worked with that thought the same thing. They thought I was depressed and like, you know, I might take my life or something. And that was not the case. But I just realized that without God and with hope of salvation through Jesus, there really is no hope and nothing matters. And so that's a very humbling and frightening thought. So I just you know, went through that time as an atheist of that's how life is. And so I realized that that was going to be a very dreary time, however long you know the rest of my life lasted. Right, that a that, dreary existence. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Because you're going to be dead a lot longer than you're going to be alive. It was a bleak time for Jason and Sally. That dreary existence motivated him all the more to find out what is true. The things he learned changed his mind, but it would take God to change his heart. And that's coming up in part two of The Unfolding. Now, we met Jason and Sally when their company became sponsors of this podcast. Here's a word about their athletic apparel company called Train. We love it when people ask us why we started the company because Jason gets to share his story and we get to tell the reason behind it. What is the reason behind it? Uh, we started the company because I went from a lukewarm churchgoer to an atheist to a follower of Christ. And we decided to start the company to serve God and love others. So what does it look like then to serve Christ through your company? Well, we get to share the gospel whenever anybody asks us about why we started, why we're doing what we're doing, as well as specific designs for causes that help share the love of Jesus to others. One of the things we've done is some Haiti designs. 
A lot of the profits go to organizations in Haiti to help educate, feed, clothe, house people in need down there. And that just comes out of your relationship with Jesus, that that becomes a part of what you do in your business. Absolutely. So if somebody wanted to find out more about your company, how could they do that? The name Train is spelled T-R-E-I-G-N. And our website is gotrain.com, which is G-O-T-R-E-I-G-N.com. And then we also have trainteamsales.com for our custom apparel as well. And now part two of Jason and Sally Hansen's story. Three to four months in that searching phase. Did you find anything while you were searching that you felt like you could hang on to and like this could be my new philosophy of life? Uh, No, no. Um, You know, after really starting with science and just doing a lot of research and reading and listening to different things, coming to the conclusion that we can't be here without something, then that led me into, okay, well, what, do we have any answers? You know, where can I find some answers? So I, I did some research on other religions. I did some, you know, research into history and archaeology. And really what happened is, is I came back full circle and realized that the only thing that makes sense is Christianity. It's the only thing to explain reality. And, you know, the problem of evil and suffering only makes sense within Christianity. You know, Christianity really gave me answers, but even then I still wasn't necessarily a believer and wasn't a a Christian and didn't realize the need for salvation. Hmm. You know, other than... I hope it's true, so that way you can go to heaven and all these other things. But I, I still didn't have that that need during that time. You know, I, I the Bible mentions miracles, and part of the reason that you know I became very skeptical was I hadn't experienced any miracles. I've never seen a miracle, and during you know the time that I was searching and I was really searching for God, I experienced some things that can't be explained, and. One of those was I was listening to a podcast and I think it was titled The Evidence for God. And I was on my way home from work listening to that and they were giving different reasons or evidences. And I stopped at a stoplight. There's cars parked in front of me. There's cars parked behind me and there's cars parked, you know, not parked, but sitting beside me getting ready to go through the intersection. There's cars on the other side. And as soon as I come to a complete stop, this bird lands on the hood of my car and sits directly in front of me, right in front of the steering wheel. I've never had a bird land on my car at any point in time in my life. And I've never been with anybody where that's ever happened. And it just sits there. And I'm like, what in the world is this bird doing? And finally I'm looking at it. I'm like, that looks like a dove. I'm not an animal, you know, or bird person. So, but that looks like a dove. And as I'm listening to this podcast, talking about the evidence for God, you know, I get to thinking, why would a bird land on the car? And so I start looking around and there's no other birds in the sky, in trees, on power lines, on cars. There's, that's the only bird that is, I can find. I mean, I'm turning my head, looking backwards and um, looking to both sides and looking in front of me, looking up in the trees and can't find a bird. Right before the light changes, the bird flies off. And I'm thinking that was really weird. And I was thinking a dove is supposed to signify something about God. And I'm like, that's just craziness. And so I started to drive off, but I watched the bird and the bird goes over and lands on a church and sits there. So I go ahead and turn and I I go home and I'm thinking, I'm going to look, look up a dove when I get home. And so I do. And it's like a spitting image of, of the bird that was sitting on the car. Now I know all doves are going to look very, very similar, but it was just like, that could have been exactly that bird. And I know that a lot of people are looking at that like, that's just a coincidence, but I I don't believe that because I've never experienced that before, haven't experienced it after. At the time when I was like questioning, well, why don't miracles happen? Where are you, God? You know, why don't you show up? And maybe he gives us enough to allow us to believe, but also to allow us to, to not believe if we don't want to. And I remember that time, that night very well. That was almost a a ray of hope for us. He came home and he was actually a little excited, which I hadn't seen him be excited about anything for a while. 
And I remember the boys Googling a dove and like trying to prove each other wrong, like what type of dove it was. And, and they shared the story. And for me, it was, I was very grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Hope. That's that, that signal of hope. After looking up a, a dove, you know, Googling it, then I went to the Bible and found passages that had a dove. And then I looked at that and I'm like, there's no way, you know, there's, that's, that's crazy that, that that happened. And honestly, I, I didn't fully believe that until after God changed my heart. And then I was like, thank you. Mm-hmm. Cause that was something that I needed through that journey. Mm-hmm. Even though I, even though I didn't believe it at the time, mm-hmm. but it was something where it was just, you know, what are the chances? And so after coming to the realization that God has to exist, there has to be some sort of God out there. It really came down to, I realized how wicked a person I was. And, and so those same people that I was looked down on, you know, for 20 plus years, I realized I was just like them. Just like your dad? Yes. I was just like my dad. And my dad had a rough time and had a rough life. And, and I wish that I could go back now and tell him I'm sorry and try to build a better relationship with him because I, I despise my dad. And if I'd went through what he did, I don't know what if it happened to me. So when I realized how wicked a person I was, when I didn't treat Sally like I should have, when I looked down on other people, I mean, that's, that's when my heart broke. And that's truly when God showed up and, and he changed my heart. And I had love for people that I didn't have before. And I had a desire to build relationships with anybody because that's what we're called to do. And that's, that's the moment that the color came back in the room. The sun was out. I mean, it was literally like a light switch went on, changed my heart, and and I could see things that I never saw before. And I had a desire to read the Bible. And when I did, I mean, it was like words jumped off the page. You know, I know I'm not the only person, but sometimes reading the Bible can be like a chore. But I mean, I had a desire to read the Bible and know what God was trying to communicate with us. And it was like verses and words jumped off the page and really had an impact on me. Hmm. It felt personal. Yeah, yeah. Did that realization happen gradually or was is there a moment that you can look back on and, and you you suddenly knew what you knew? Uh, it was, I mean, the, the realization that God has to exist was gradual. The realization that I needed Jesus to be my savior was instant. It was a Saturday morning. And I, I, we had a conversation, Sally and I did in the bedroom, and I still was holding on to I'm a better person than other people. And for whatever reason, I finally realized that I'm not and that I'm a wicked person and that I need a Savior. And the only hope that I have is in Jesus. And that's when it changed. She was in the other room. Um, we had just, just finished talking about all these issues. And I I didn't really say anything to her about it, but I'm sure, and we've not talked about it, but I'm sure she could just see a difference in me immediately. Mm-hmm. I, in that conversation, I, I believe I was crying again <laughs> um, because it comes to a point where you can pray for the person, but frustration sets in. Mm-hmm. And I was at that point. I, I think I just walked out and I hugged her. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it was, it was just like, Walked out of the bedroom and everything's been different ever since then. Like night and day, huh? Yeah. yeah. I mean, God changed me. And, and so one of the Bible verses that has, has really stuck out since then is, you know, when Jesus says, you know, the, the greatest commandment is to love God and second is to love others. And so that's really, you know, what, what I've tried to do since then. And that really translated into some pretty big changes in your life. I mean, once you decided you believed... Mm-hmm. Did you take stock? How did that series of events happen? Oh, yeah, it, it was, I mean, it was, it was still a, a process, but I mean, like the next week, there was a guy at work that I just absolutely despised and could not stand because I looked down on him and thought, you know, he does a bunch of stuff that's wrong. And, you know, the next week, as soon as I could, I walked straight up to him, shook his hand, told him I was sorry for being a jerk and that I loved him and that if I could help him at work or with anything else that I would, I would. And, you know, he kind of looked at me like, what in the world are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) And so 
Um, <laughs> but there's been there's been several you know instances like that. And the biggest change though for us was that you found your purpose. Yeah. Well, I, I'd had a passion to to run an athletic apparel company for 20 years and never had acted on it. And so I decided there's a reason why I have that passion and that I was going to do that to serve God and to love others. And so I started an athletic apparel company to do just that. And through that, we have been able to share our story and our faith. And I've been able to witness to more people in the last couple years than I did in 20 plus years of being a lukewarm churchgoer. Hmm. Because the roots of that company really are in that whole right. transformation of your faith, Yes. right? I mm-hmm. mean, it would never have happened had you not had that experience. No. No. Wasn't even on the radar. Never, never had a conversation about it in our 20 years of marriage. About the athletic apparel company? Yep. Really? Yep. Right. And yet it was something you'd kind of been dreaming about all that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just like our own children, we tell them, find what you're passionate about mm-hmm. and use it to serve God. We are, we do sell athletic apparel, but I, it's a mission field for us. I truly look at it that way. And that's, you know, we are designed to serve God and to love others. So let's find what we're good at, what we're equipped to do, and let's do it. Initially, though, you started it on the side, I yeah. assume, because you yeah. had your lucrative sales job. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. was making $10 an hour as a teacher's assistant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was, I mean, yeah, I had a good sales job and we, we just, you know, did the apparel on the side, but, you know, within about five or six months, we started doing that full time and I walked away from my sales job. So, you know, it was a big leap of faith to do that because, you know, we weren't sure if we were really going to be successful. We weren't sure, you know, how we were going to pay our bills. Um, we were I'd, building a brand new home that had just got completed. It was very scary financially, but... Honestly, I felt no stress or no, there was no strain on our marriage during any of that. The kids didn't even have a clue, like they were fine. Um, so it's affirmed <laughs> at that time, almost on a daily basis by God that he's got it. It's so nice to have that kind of confirmation along the way, isn't it? Absolutely. Because it keeps you going. Yep. Well, I mean, and if you're worried about how much money you're going to make, you know, then you're not gonna you're not gonna make that decision. And so I didn't look at it like that. I looked at it as I have this passion. I'm gonna use that passion to serve God. I'm not gonna worry about how much money we make with it. We'll have to make other decisions based on on money possibly. But if we do this to serve God, then everything else will be fine. And so you know we didn't we didn't take a paycheck from the company for 23 months. Wow. And you know my wife was when we started were was a part-time teacher. So, but we've been just fine and been able to do exactly what we felt like God wanted us to do. We get an opportunity to share our story with people, some who are Christians and some who are not, and to share our faith. And, you know, hopefully we plant a seed in those that are not Christians. And hopefully we encourage those that are Christians. And I, I'm very confident that we've done both of those. Um, and we may not know how that, you know, impacts others down the road or how God will use that, but uh, hopefully we're just willing and obedient to to be able to step out and, you know, take a chance with people and, and share share our story and share our faith with them. If you struggle with doubts about your faith, Jason wants you to know it's okay. He says he realizes now and looking back on his life, he had a lot of doubts. Doubts about the stories in the Bible, about Jonah or the flood. He had doubts about whether those could be real, whether God was real, but he was afraid of what he might find out if he looked into those questions. And he felt guilty about having doubts. Now in hindsight, he realizes almost every person in the Bible dealt with doubt. Moses, John the Baptist, the disciples. Jason says, everybody has doubts. Everybody deals with questions. But he's found that if you take those to God, look for answers. God is faithful and often resolves those doubts and questions. Big thanks to Jason and Sally for sharing their story. They believe in the power of God's stories. It's one of the reasons their company, Train Fitness Gear and Athletic Apparel, is sponsoring the unfolding. We're so grateful for their support. You can learn more about what they do at gotrain.com. That's go, T-R-E-I-G-N.com. Once again, super grateful for Jason Rackow. He is the producer that makes every story sound so good. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with another page in The Unfolding.